Hello and welcome to our first Mission Monday. Um, I'm so excited to be with you, even in, in this digital uh, streaming format. It's still a, an awesome opportunity to be with your community, to pray with you, to learn with you, to unpack sacred scripture together. I'm in my home office uh, down in Lake Charles, Louisiana. I'm Katie Prejean McGrady. I am a speaker and an author. Um, normally, I'm traveling around the country, uh, jetting back and forth from youth conferences to parish missions to diocesan training days. Uh, you name it, I've probably spoken to them and about a topic somehow relevant within the life of the church. Uh, and I love what I get to do. Obviously, it's been a little on hold since the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and even as the world begins to slowly reopen, you know, the past few weeks, months even, um, has really been an opportunity for my husband and I to, to kind of reevaluate and to think about the pace of life that we've been in. I think that's true for a lot of people. Um, and it's amazing to me how quickly parishes, especially your own parish, adapted and got creative and figured out ways to stay connected to the parish community, figured out ways to remain um, in community and fellowship, to, to know what's going on in people's lives, to still be present with them, to still help them understand hope is alive. And even in the midst of these struggles and these challenges and these uncertain times, hope comes to life within us. And we're called to share that hope. So for the next three Mondays, that's what we're gonna unpack together. How that hope is alive. How you and I can articulate that hope to our brothers and sisters in Christ. How we ourselves can discover and find that hope and, and hold fast to it. I love that phrase, hold fast to hope, as if hope is something we cling to that leads to something else. And I think that's very true. I mean, think about what you anticipate in life. Um, in the midst of the pandemic, my biggest activity in the course of a week was going to my grocery pickup. And sometimes when you order your groceries, right, you probably know this to be true, we go to Walmart because it's just easy to do it right on your app. Uh, but every now and then we'd have to go to Kroger, a local grocery affiliate here down in the South. I think they have them up in Illinois. Um, it's kind of like a jewel, right? And the thing about Kroger that's different than Walmart, and, and the reason I prefer Walmart to Kroger is Walmart notifies you like an hour ahead of time. Hey, we had to make some substitutions. So instead of this brand of cheese, you got that brand of cheese. Or hey, we were out of this thing. And you know, if you want us to have it shipped to you, we can figure out how to do that, right? With Kroger, you just kind of show up and it's, it's Russian roulette. You don't know what you're gonna get. And they just hand you this printout that tells you, okay, well, this is the stuff you got and this is the stuff we had to substitute and we hope you're okay with it, see you later, bye. Like there's no consenting. There's no, yeah, I agree to that substitution. So very, very early on in the pandemic, um, I got home on March 11th from a uh, parish mission in Missouri. And within five days, every event that I had scheduled for April, May, and into June was off the calendar, either canceled or rescheduled for later in the fall, and I'm having a baby in September, so I can't be there. So my husband and I are, are kind of sitting around, and we're not gonna starve, we're gonna be fine financially, but obviously, you know, there's gonna be a bit of an adjustment because I'm not gonna be traveling to do this job that I've been doing for so long. And my husband just kind of joked, you're gonna have to find a hobby. You're gonna go stir crazy. And he's not wrong. I'm the kind of person that I can veg, I can sit still, I can scroll on my phone for uninterrupted hours of time. I'm a millennial after all, but I need to be productive in some way. So I've been working on a book, so I, you know, my next book, so I need to finish that. So, okay, I've got that little project and there's some home improvement things we wanna do, some closets that need to be cleaned out. And Obviously we need to get the nursery ready for the new baby. But then I realized, you know, I have always wanted to bake, like to bake more. I got a stand mixer for Christmas, so I might as well start using it besides just making prepackaged muffin packets, right? So I started researching some recipes. I ordered a couple of bread baking cookbooks and we all know one of the critical ingredients in bread is yeast. And yeast back in March and April was kind of hard to come by. So I hop on Kroger on their app one day to order groceries because there were no Walmart pickup spots and I see that they have yeast in stock. And so I add four jars of yeast to our order in the hope that I would maybe get one. 
Well, my husband goes to pick up the order that evening. We put our two-year-old down to bed. My husband drives into the driveway and he's laughing. I said, what's so funny? He said, oh, we, we got the yeast all right. Well, rather than four jars of yeast, which would equal, you know, almost a, a half a pound of yeast, they gave us the little packets of yeast. If you've ever baked bread or, or done anything like this in the kitchen, you know what I'm talking about. These little packets of yeast that are like two and a half tablespoons worth of yeast in each packet. They gave us 45 packets to try to substitute for the fact that they couldn't give us the four jars. And we laughed and laughed because I doubt I would have confirmed that kind of substitution had they notified me ahead of time. It happened a few weeks later, I ordered this giant thing of cinnamon because I wanted to make cinnamon scones and they didn't have the big thing of cinnamon. So instead we got 19 small little shakers of cinnamon. All right, we, we pull into the grocery store pickup and we've got this hope within our heart that we're gonna get something that we ordered. And that's a form of hope, right? This, this, I long for something to be as I want it to be. I hold on to this idea in my head. But there's something deeper when we, we talk about this, this virtue, this, this faithful virtue of hope, this theological virtue of hope, which is this idea that I believe in something bigger and better than anything that I could possibly imagine for myself. A hope that comes from Christ alone. Not a hope in just a fulfilled grocery order. Not a hope uh, that I'm going to get the job promotion or that I'm going to be able to see somebody at a certain time or, uh, you know, that my favorite television show is going to be renewed, but a hope in something supernatural, a hope in something divine. And it's not even necessarily a hope in something but rather a hope in someone. There's this great story at the beginning of the Gospel of John. Um, and if you know, you know anything about sacred scripture, you know that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are known as the synoptic gospels. So the gospels that are similar, the same, they fit together. They have similar stories, similar structures, similar writing styles. They go in a, a similar chronological order in some sense. And then we get this Gospel of John, which is, is kind of the, um, the outlier. It's written by the beloved apostle, so the one who was there by Jesus' side, who witnessed everything firsthand, who knew Jesus well, his best friend, who stood at the foot of the cross. And he writes this gospel from his eyewitness testimony, right? It, it, it's his eyewitness testimony. It's what he saw, what he heard, what he felt, what he smelled. I had a, a priest spiritual director one time tell me that I should pray through scripture and imagine what it smelled like. And I laughed in his face and I was like, ah, they didn't take baths back then a whole lot. Like, I'm not sure that I want to do that. And he said, it'll help you feel more present to what you're reading. And it was an incredible spiritual exercise. So think about the smells, think about the sounds, think about what you would be seeing when you're reading through the Gospel of John, because you're, you're reading the story of what someone saw as he was there with Jesus. And the Gospel of John begins, it tells us, you know, the beautiful prologue of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came to be through him, and without him nothing came to be. Right? And we, we get this beautiful exhortation. He was in the world, and the world came to be through him, but the world did not know him. Right? And the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us, and we saw His glory, the glory as of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. This beautiful exhortation of Christ has come. And then we get the story, the first real tactile hold on to what's happening, people talking to one another story. And we get John the Baptist. And John the Baptist is out in the desert. And, and John the Baptist is kind of a weird figure in Scripture. He's Jesus' cousin. You know, we know that he was born to Elizabeth um, and, and Zechariah and, and that he would have reasonably perhaps known Jesus as a child. But he's out in the desert and, and John the Baptist was a prophet, right? John the Baptist was the one who, who made way for Jesus. And he's proclaiming, he's preaching baptism. He's preaching repentance to the point where he's annoying the religious leaders in town because he's saying life has to look different. And we know this about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they don't want to change because they like the power that they have. 
So John the Baptist is a, is a bit of a live wire. He's, he's kind of a, a controversial figure. And then these two guys, fishermen, their names are Andrew and John, and they are uh, inspired by what John the Baptist is saying. They like him. They like what he's saying. They like, they like his approach to preaching. Um, I'm sure they probably liked his personality. I mean, John the Baptist was, again, he was this live wire kind of guy. He wore a hair shirt. He ate locusts. I mean, he was just, he was a hipster before hipster was a word. And he's preaching one day, and Andrew and John are listening to him, probably hanging on every word, and Jesus walks past them in the desert. And John the Baptist points at Jesus, and he says, Behold the Lamb of God. Andrew and John's curiosity is piqued, right? That's not language that they've heard every day, right? We don't often point at people and say, There's the Lamb of God, behold him, right? So they walk over to Jesus. And as they're following behind Jesus, kind of curious, like, Who is this guy? What's he all about? Jesus stops and he turns around and he looks at them and he says, What are you looking for? Catches them off guard. What are you looking for? Andrew and John probably weren't expecting Jesus to ask them a question. And so they don't really have an answer. And so they blurt out really quickly, uh, where are you staying? And I imagine at this moment, Jesus kind of rolls his eyes because Jesus doesn't really have a hotel that he's going to stop at later on in the evening. And he doesn't have a printed agenda with color coordinated stops along the way. He looks at them, I imagine, chuckles, sighs, and sizes them up for a second. And he sees before him two fishermen who, for some reason, were compelled to come talk to him after his cousin announced his presence in the desert. So Jesus says to them three words that change the course of human history, and that's not an exaggeration. Jesus looks at them and says, come and see. He doesn't say, I'm going here to do this, and then I'm going to go over there, and I'm going to do that, and here's the time, and here's the date, and here's the person. He says, come, and just look with me. Watch. Witness. Spend time with me. Andrew and John do something really profound at that moment themselves. They go. They don't think about maybe what was on their own calendar or what they had planned for later that day, they, they just go. They go with Jesus that day and they spend time with him, talk to him, watch what he's doing and listen to what he's saying. And years later when John is writing this weird gospel, his eyewitness account that has, has I don't wanna say stumped us, but has intrigued us for generations because it's so different than the other three gospels. He puts in there that they went with him that day and it was about four o'clock in the afternoon. Which means that the first time that John encountered Jesus Christ, it was such a profound moment of encounter that it changed the trajectory of his life forever. And he remembered the time of day when he first talked to Jesus. Let that sink into your head for just a moment. That when John met Jesus, it changed everything about his life. And he remembered the time that he had the first conversation with him. Because something within him was stirred. His heart was stirred up. His mind was transformed. There was a renewal that took place because of that encounter with Jesus Christ. Dare I say, some hope was, was planted in his heart an excitement, a joy, an anticipation, a wondering of well, what could be. I think if we really want to ponder the concept of hope and how hope comes alive, how hope is alive, how we witness to hope with our brothers and sisters in Christ, with our friends and with our family, with people we see every day, with perfect strangers, in the middle of a pandemic, or if the world is back to normal as we expect it to be, hopefully soon, right? That hope is that thing within us that comes to life when we hear the words of Jesus Christ as he says to us, come and see, come with me. Come spend some time with me. Let's get to know each other. Let's talk. I want to listen. 
I want to hear what's on your heart. I want to hear what's on your mind. I want to answer your questions. I want to just be with you. You know, Andrew and John go with Jesus that day. And we know that, that, that they remember the time. And then the next little story that we get right here at the beginning of the Gospel of John, we're still in chapter one. We're not even at the wedding at Cana, which is like party time Jesus, right? We're still very, very early in this Gospel. Andrew, who's a fisherman, has a brother, Simon. And he goes to Simon and he says, we have found the Messiah. He was so compelled by that first encounter with Christ. He knows who he's just met. He goes to his brother and he says, come back and meet him with me. You need to meet him too. He's pretty great. And Simon goes with Andrew and he meets Jesus and Jesus takes one look at him and says, you are Peter. You are now Peter. He changes his name. He changes his identity as one who will now follow Christ. And of course we know who Peter is, right? The first Pope. Peter who denies Jesus three times. Peter who chops a guy's ear off. Peter who walks on water. Peter who's crucified upside down because he doesn't feel worthy to die the same way as his savior. That Peter meets Jesus because his brother met him first and heard the words come and see. And his brother was filled with such hope that he goes and he finds somebody else to share that with. Right? Hope is alive, not because it just falls down from the sky like rain and we, we catch it in a coffer. Hope is alive in our hearts and we share it with others and it continues to live. And it's not just hope in the form of, of hoping I get my grocery order or hoping that somebody is safe or hoping that I'll get to, to do the things that I like to do when I want to do them again soon. It's, it's hope in the gospel. It's hope in Christ Jesus. It's, it's hope in the resurrection. Right? This is the thing. Our hope within this world is sometimes almost limited. Limited to tactile, tangible, material things. And there's nothing wrong with hoping and tactile and tangible and material things happening the way we want them to happen. There's nothing wrong with that. But there's a deeper hope that we're called to have. A hope that is rooted in the fact that Christ won victory. That Christ rose from the dead. I mean, put yourself in the position of, of John again. John meets Jesus for the first time here at the beginning of the Gospels. He sees him, he gets to know him, he spends time with him. And then three years later, he watches his best friend, who for the past three years he has watched heal and preach and teach and, and change the world before him. He watches that same man be condemned to die, whipped and beaten and scourged to the point of, of nearly bleeding out, forced to carry wooden beams up a hill, nailed upon a cross and executed in a, a horrific and brutal way. And he stands at the foot of that cross and he hears his best friend say, behold your mother. Knowing in that moment, okay, this is, this is pretty final, right? I, I, I often think sometimes that maybe the apostles were like holding on to this idea that, well, he's not going to die. Like he's going to get right to the point of death. He's going to get right up on that cross and he's going to let everybody think he's about to die. And then he's just going to like zoom off the cross like a superhero and shut it all down and prove to everybody you can't defeat me. Like maybe for a half a second, that's what they were holding on to. They believed that Jesus wouldn't die, even though he kept saying it again and again and again, it was hard for them to comprehend. And yet there he is standing at the foot of the cross, the beloved apostle, the best friend who was there and heard those words come and see at the very beginning of this story, standing there listening to his friends say, take care of my mom for me. There and watching Mary hold the lifeless body of Christ after he breathes his last. There when his best friend is wrapped in cloth and laid in a tomb. And there, when they get the news from Mary Magdalene that the body of Jesus is gone, that he's not in that tomb anymore. Can you imagine the hope that probably flooded John's heart in that moment when Mary comes running into the room and says, he's, I, I saw him, he's, he's back, he's risen from the dead. Can you imagine the joy and the excitement in something profound? in something vastly different than he could have ever expected? Hope is not just in the material. Hope is in the divine. 
And hope comes alive when we allow ourselves, we give ourselves permission to come and see what remarkable things God perhaps has in store for us. Things that we could not have even pictured for ourselves. Right? Every single one of us watching this right now, me giving this right now, every single person in this world has experienced a moment where things don't go as we've expected or we have planned. A promotion doesn't go through. Uh, something goes wrong with our house, within our family. Somebody is sick and they don't recover. You name it, we've experienced it. And there's these moments where we begin to think hope is dead. Hope is gone. There's no way that anything could ever get better ever again. Back in uh, 2017, my husband and I were newlyweds. We were expecting our first daughter and our job contracts didn't get renewed at the school that we taught at. It was a little bit dramatic. There were some crazy things going on. The principal that didn't renew our job contracts then lost his job himself, but then they didn't bring us back because they thought it would be a bad look uh, to, to bring a couple people back, even though this guy had been found to be kind of corrupt. And it hurt. I'm obviously very much abbreviating the story, but it, it hurt because a wrong was committed against us. It was unjust. And I was pregnant. We were expecting our first baby. We just bought a house. We needed jobs. And my husband and I were very much in kind of this, this moment, this, this pit of despair almost, where it seemed like this isn't gonna work. This isn't the life that we were expecting or even promised. It's not what we want and this isn't fair. Those words often come out of our mouths. This isn't fair. This isn't, this isn't what God promised me. This isn't the hope that I was promised. This isn't, this isn't what he told me was going to happen. And we reject hope. We push hope away because rather than hearing the words, come and see what I have to offer you, we show up to Jesus and we say, I want to show you what I want and what I need, and then you're going to give it to me. Andrew and John heard the words, come and see, and they didn't look at Jesus and say, oh, okay, but first I've got to do this, 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 and this, so I can meet you next Tuesday for like half an hour at Starbucks. They didn't, they didn't put Jesus into a box of their own agenda. They didn't say, this is what we want to go see. This is what we want you to show us. They went freely. They trusted. And what they saw that day changed them forever. They remember the time of day. They love him so much that, that John is willing to stand at the foot of the cross. Andrew runs and finds his brother and brings him back to Jesus because what they witnessed was better than anything they could have ever imagined. And when we fall on hard times, when we experience hurt and pain and disappointment, when our hope seems gone and snuffed out, it's in those moments that we begin to recognize and to see, maybe he's trying to show me something differently than what I was looking for. Maybe hope is alive in a different way than I was expecting or thought. Maybe I can show that hope to other people in a way that only I can do. Do you think anybody else would have been able to grab Simon and bring him to Jesus? No, it was his brother, his brother that he fished with every day, his brother that he trusted, his brother that he knew. Sometimes you and your experience of living hope is uniquely suited to bring someone closer to Christ, is uniquely suited to invite somebody to come and see what he has to offer. As my husband and I struggled through this, this jobless period where we didn't quite know what was coming next, three huge things happened for us. The first was we had a priest, a very, very good and holy man, look at us and say the most profound thing I've ever heard in my life. He looked at us and he said, the devil wants to convince you that what you once had was the only thing God ever had to offer you. He lies to you. He tells you that that good thing that you loved was all God ever had to give you. And God will never give you anything good ever again. And so because you lost that, whatever the circumstances were, God can never provide another good thing for you. He wants to convince you that you're stuck. And when we believe that we're stuck, we stop trusting in the goodness of God's offerings and gifts because we think that's where we have to stay. That was the first thing. Don't fall into the trap of thinking you're stuck because then hope cannot come to life. The second thing, people rallied around us, support and friends, people that we could talk to about how we were feeling and where we were struggling and what questions and worries we had. 
And within a month, my husband had a teaching job and, and I had some great support systems in place to help me as I decided to make the jump into full-time writing and speaking. For years, I'd always either been a parish youth minister or a teacher. I'd always had boots on the ground somewhere. And, and enough people were able to talk me into taking a stab at, at speaking on my own and, and working for different writing associations and, and doing things almost in like a freelance style. And I had a dear, dear friend who's been doing this for years look at me and say, if you don't think you can do it, that's wrong. There's enough of us who believe in you. At what point are you going to believe in yourself and believe that God knows you can do this? We can't believe that we're stuck. We also have to lean on the fact that God desires for us to trust in him to do great things. Because he knows that we are capable of that when we lean upon him. The third kind of moment that happened that brought hope back into our lives was something very simple. And this is where I wanna to end today. And that is making a list of the things that we were already grateful for. Even in the midst of losing our jobs, even in the midst of, of wondering what was coming next and the fears surrounding a new baby and this home that we just purchased, right? If we could sit down every day and just think of three or four things that we knew we could hold on to, we knew that greater things would be yet to come. We weren't stuck. We trusted in God's gifts and promises and in the words of those who knew and loved us. And we saw what he'd already given to us, knowing full well that Christ, God, the Holy Spirit, they have never said to us, come and see, and then not shown us something beautiful and great. They only ever say, come and see, because they know what they want to show us will transform us. Because they know, God knows, He knows, He knows what we need. He knows what you need. And He longs to give it to us. That hope comes alive, hope is alive, hope can be shared with others, because we've seen how hope has been alive in our lives. As we begin these Mission Mondays together, I want you to spend the next few days pondering. What have been some moments where you felt stuck? Who have been the people that have helped you get unstuck and shown you God's goodness? And what things and, and people and places and, and what has been given to you in your life that has shown you God's goodness? and be grateful for those things. And when we can hold on to that, then we can more clearly hear and see those words of Christ himself, come and see, and be shown remarkable and incredible things. I'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us.